folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg she's Show. Got, and, she's got the number for this. And uh, we're joined here today uh, by an absolute legendary drummer and, um, and a cat who can still play at 85 years young. Colin Bailey, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Can you talk about when you were in a in the band with the um, uh, you know you had the uh, accordions oh, yeah. and there was no bass there was no upright the bass bass there was no such thing in those days <laughs> so I mean even if you could demonstrate on the kit how you actually kept oh, how did you it. how did you keep it together man well that was two accordions banjo and drums in those days 1941 it was like. <laughs> So there wasn't, was there no room for the bass, really? I never heard of the bass in those days, you know. Uh, I don't know, was, I never ever saw one until I was older. But um, yeah, it was pretty horrible. I mean, I, I, I wish I had a tape of it because to a chord. They played sheet music with no harmony, you know? I mean, it must have sounded like hell. <laughs> The, well, that was my point, is that I want, you, you learned music. Can you just talk to the audience about how you learn music by ear? What, what's happening in today's yeah. world is that uh, jazz, for instance, has been moved into the academy. So cats are learning to read music before they can hear it. But when you learn by ear, your ears are unlocked. Yeah, well, so I wanted you to talk a little bit about I, that. I learned, I learned to, to uh, read drill music when I was 10. My teacher at the time had me American Patrol was my first piece of music I really put in there. And, uh, but you have to be able to read because, like I was saying, every band you ever played with had a book, you know, so it was drum charts, so you have to be able to read. But uh, I started reading when I was 10, so uh, I was so lucky. I was able to play music my whole life. Uh, uh, I was in a band when I was like 12. There's another great band called the Firecrackers. My dad was in the fire service during the war, and he had this band, was, the lineup was even worse than the accordion. It was like trumpet, violin, and some, I mean, just ridiculous. I don't know what we played, but uh, hideous, I'm sure. But that was lasted a while, and uh, I was playing uh, once a month at the Tavern Hall, and I started playing with this same band like every weekend. And then uh, I got to, uh, I got an audition to go with Winifred Outlaw. She was a commercial pianist. She became a big star, you know, so it was my first, like, name gig when I was 18. So I was on the road in the traveling, world travel when I was just young. So I was always, you know, would you, say, would, you, would you say that, was there skiffle music going on? At the, in, was there any oh, kind of, be, like, like I'm curious about, yeah. was there anything close to bebop going on in England? Oh, yeah. Well, and who were the forefront? Who, who were the uh, forerunners uh, there? Jimmy Duker was a child of the, the, the Ronnie Scott. Uh, who was before Tubby? Uh, Phil Seaman was one of the drummers. Tony Kinsey. Who? No, talk about Ronnie Scott. I mean, I knew that as the club, but you're he, telling me he was a proficient I, player. I never ever met Ronnie Scott. I never played his club. Victor played it twice. And Monty Victor played, Feldman, yeah. No, Monty and I couldn't go because we were doing work with Benny Goodman. There's a funny story about, uh, do you know about the Goon show, Spike Milligan? No. Crazy stuff. Peter Sellers, uh, 1952, so a radio show. And uh, Spike had relatives in Australia, and he sent them this, he played the piano at their house, he had this tune that he wrote. So Victor made a, did a chart of it, and, and when Spike Milligan came into Ronnie Scott's, Victor played the tune. <laughs> And Spike Lee was looking at him like, huh? Where did you get this from? Man? You couldn't believe it. Victor, you got a kick out of that. Here. The, one thing the audience may not be aware of is that Victor Feldman uh, was playing in the Glenn Miller Big Band. Playing. Well, he, no, he sat in with them. He sat in them. with them at 10 years, 10 old, years old and playing drums. Yeah, and that's, that's the drums you hear overdubs on the... Uh, what do you call it? Right, the... Uh, uh, Artful Dodger. Uh, Artful Dodger, but th that was spliced in there. Yeah. I mean, would you say that uh, that the first time, yeah, no, yeah, mm. but your first real bandstand experience with jazz yeah. was in Sydney. Would you say that's fair? 
Mike Forrest said, yeah, I know. And Bryce Brody, who's a piano player in the Australian Jazz Quartet Quintet, they had gone back to Australia and split up after a concert tour. And he got the piano. And uh, so I was playing quite a bit of jazz. Got in the studio scene there. I left Australia, you know, it had been for coming to the States with that groove, and I'd probably still be there. But, uh, what were they doing though rhythmically? Because Jack Brokenshaw was in that group, yeah, well, and and, and that was. It, yeah, did they even have drums in the group at that time? He played some drums, but they had this like novel thing where the guy played an oboe, you know, Errol Buddle. But uh, Bryce Rohde was great, man. When he brought me over to the states, and he did me the biggest favor I could ever have. Well, explain that. How did he? Because rest in peace, that dude was yeah, one of the baddest yeah. cats. And how how did you, as an immigrant, how did you get here? <laughs> I mean, it's a pretty hot button issue today. Yeah, no, I know, you know, no, but I mean, everybody did, but people did. No, I flew over with uh, on an airplane. Uh, the four of us came over, and uh, the Kingston Trail. That's how we got to come to the states. We were their opening act or group, and uh, we got on so good with them. They loved the music we played, so they invited us to a six weekend tour in, in the states, Seattle and various places. Phoenix, I think we played, and um, so I came over in, and then when I was done, I was at the drum shop, and I was thinking we'd have to go back to Australia, and Vince Garali called me, so he'd heard me play with that group, and wanted to have me play, <laughs> he fired his drummer, I was good, I felt bad about that, but, uh, and hired me, so I'm playing with him and Monty Ludwig, must like a dream come true, you know, could go dying going to heaven, so to speak. Uh, it was an incredible experience to play with those guys six nights a week, you know. When I, when I interviewed Lewis Hayes a couple months ago, he said that yeah. nobody ever told him what to play. No. And I'm just no. curious about when you joined Vince. Never told me what to play, ever. Can you, were you already doing your bass drum? Uh, can you d talk about a little bit yeah. of the time feel that you would, you would even demonstrate the way you would play with Vince? No, no, no. I never played the bass. Well, we were rehearsing when I came to the States with the Australian group. Yeah. We were rehearsing in a very small room at the drum shop, and the piano player said, could you not, not play the bass drum for the bar because it's covering the bass notes? So I started to do that. The bass notes on the piano? Yeah. Yeah, right. The bass notes on the bass. The boom, 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 so bass don't play the bass drum. Yeah, don't play the bass drum. Interesting. So uh, I got into that, and I, I still don't play the bass drum. You know, if you're playing the blues, you know, you can you know, play the bass drum, but... You know, uh, I think that happened. So then, uh, when I was still in, in San Francisco, I came up with this bass drum technique that I had. I used to have. Yeah, well, let's, I mean, let's, for the audience, I, I mean, let's let's see. I mean, I heard a little bit of it in the intro, but I'd love to see a little bit of it. You know, I, can't, I lost the technique because I don't practice anymore. What was going on before in bass drum, and 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 how did you how did you create that concept? Guys, this played time. Mel Lewis gave a lesson like on you know feathering the bass drum. I never got into that because of what the guy in the Australian group said. You know, don't play the bass drum. So uh, that's I just got into that kind of playing. Uh, uh, it's it's weird though because you know, I I just. I just rely on the bass, you know, for the, for the bottom. You go down bottom, that's why I can't, I can't do gigs without a bass. I wouldn't ever do that, you know. Uh, well, you did in England with the accordion group. Oh, but yeah, yeah, but, yeah, that was before I <laughs> became a drummer. Uh, but was your technique about using the bass drum as a counterpoint to the, to the, to the actual bass? No, I didn't even sing it. Simple. 
龙嘛，一样。Like an instrument, da ba da da ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da two bars. So you play with some more drum and two more bars. I wrote a, I wrote a book on that. You know, there's some things on on the uh, on the uh, YouTube the demonstration of that thing. You know, that's very simple, really. But the instrumentalists, they they play in phrases. Whatever you know, so that's like I like to play a soloing like that, you know, phrases. So I wrote a book on it. What's the book here? It's called Yes, Drum Solos: The Art of Phrasing. It will present to us, but that's what it is. I mean, did it did it lessen the language but make it more more coherent by using phrases? Because otherwise, you just it just becomes this cacophony of noise. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's why I got into playing the, the two bar phrase thing. How I got into that was I had a student that lived in San Francisco. Uh, he was in a college big band, and he brought a chart. Who was the student? Oh God, I don't know. <laughs> a few thousand students. But he he brought the chart over. He says. At the end of this thing, I got a four bar solo. What am I playing? Right. So I did some things. I, I realized what I was doing. You know, it, it hit me all of a sudden. I was playing in phrases two bars, two bars, two bars, two bars, however many you want to you know, do a whole solo in phrases. If I, if I play, I just like, I like to play choruses, you know? I don't like to play fours, like zip, you know, it's gone. But uh, I like to play choruses. But you have to know two, you know? So I wrote a thing in that uh, uh, book called like Green Dolphin Street. You know, you know the melody. Da 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 I dig, I dig. It was funny to write that. When when you and Vince first connected, um, you mentioned about Joe Pass. He never liked to practice, but like, well, he practiced. He I'm sorry, he didn't want to rehearse. No rehearse. What was Vince's? Like, for instance, jazz impressions of Black Orpheus. Yeah, well, we used to rehearse that every week. But, I mean, once a, once a, a week? or I mean, yeah, I, once a week I, I feel like rehearsal. Vince... So we, were, we were playing six nights a week. So when we did, right, you were already on the bandstand six nights a week. Yeah, but when we did that album, we were already doing the gig that night. We went in at midnight and recorded the whole album in four hours. Do you remember what studio? Was it Wally Hyde or, yeah, fan, or was no, it Fantasy? Wally was a... No, he wasn't Wally. Somebody else. He was a really good engineer. Did a Channel Nine in, in San Francisco. It was for fantasy. Was it Ralph Gleason? Maybe I'm trying to figure out who the who the engineer was. Um, anyway, you were you played a full set of music that night, and then hours. and then went in and cut jazz uh, black oh, yeah. orchestra. And we played in four hours all album. But we've been playing it, so it was like just play it like we did on the gig. You know, it was simple. Uh, I got some photographs and we had a big. Um, yeah, Fantasy Records was an album, like a new record company, but they didn't have a studio yet. That's what we did at Channel 9 in, in San Francisco. But, uh, was it interesting for you, like, when you would do the... I remember talking to Mike Clark, uh, you know, he would be uh, doing the Charlie Brown Christmas specials after you, and then he'd, he'd be on listening, uh, he'd be watching the, watching the show, and he'd be like, hey, that, that's my drumming. Like, did you did you get off on the idea? I, I was on the original uh, thing for TV or something. Like that. How did those things work in the studio? Like, in, in terms, I mean, because that that required a lot of sight reading. Well, you know, no reading. That was this. Never, never any music. So he came in the studio, and, and uh, Monty and I were there. He came in and says, 
for this music for Charlie Brown and Christmas. Well, I grew up in England, and I have no idea who Charlie Brown was, you know. Char no Charlie Brown in England? No. Well, not, not then. And then no Christmas. But, but you, there, you knew Christmas. But did you know the, the traditional Western Christmas songs? No, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I did. But um, I used to like to hear it in Japan. We get, if you know any Christmas, we was happy to sing it. Well, I've got something to do with that. It's okay. I mean, it's I just... Think, I think it's charming myself. Absolutely. You know, anyway. Yeah, yeah. But I never heard Charlie Brown. So we just, we did those things, you know, and... Uh, how, so how how much of of it was it was about playing to that character as well in the rhythm? I have no idea. We just played the tunes. I have no idea what it went on. Uh, but it was an experience, you know. I mean, I did some nice albums with Vince. I did, uh, that one where he's got two of them on the cover. With, with Fred Marshall and, 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 Fran and Francisco Aguabel. Someone Benny Velarde's on that album playing the Scratcher. You know, I mean, L L Jim Keltner was one of your young students. Is that yeah. right? I want you to tell me. You, you thought he was a train wreck in jazz. I, I said, that you're never going to make it. You know, <laughs> you know, that's what he did. Man. Like, well, no, he yeah. actually stopped I me. Mean, but, but to his credit, as we've been digging through your record collection, he was on some Claire Fisher albums. So he I did. I think just one. Right, but he did get it together a little. What was it about? He was too infatuated? Because I've interviewed Keltner a bunch. And he was a jazz fanatic. Oh, yeah. I so what was it about that made you say, I, I don't know if you're going to... It was just the, uh, the technical part and just playing jazz in general. He didn't seem to have a, you know, the feel or whatever. I can't remember. It's my 1964 or whatever. And the owner of DW Drill Company, Don Lombardi, was a student of mine at the same time. So I screwed both of them up, you know. <laughs> uh, Jim became an incredible drummer at what he does, man. I mean, he's I mean, what, what is it, you just said, he, what are the components of feel that you need to have in order to play improvisational, melodic music? Syncopation is so different. That's why it's easier to play jazz and then go into the straight eight, we call it straight eight, you know, with the metric music. But it is for metric music drummers to come and play jazz. Why is that? Some of the Brazilian guys, they can play fast. <laughs> but to get a drum thing, they don't get have it, the feel. So that's what some of the drummers, especially guys who play played rock. And, uh, so it, it, the idea of being able to play jazz, it, it allows you sort of an how would you say this? An elasticity to yes. is that what it That's is? A good word. Is that the way to say it? And yeah, and, yeah. and then because I I, play, I haven't played any rock, rock music, straight music. So I went to Australia. I was playing in the studios. And you had to see what the sound. The sound of these it was like something they had in the states where they had the Australian version. Sure. And we played like rock music, but it was easy for me to do. You know, I mean, it wasn't like more complex like it got to be. It was just a straight thing to have it all day. But uh, I don't have any trouble doing that. Did you did you see Coltrane in his modal yes. period? Yes, I saw. Can him. you talk about? I saw Coltrane with Elvin and McCoy Tyner and Reggie Wardman at the Jazz Workshop in 1961, and I thought, what the hell are they doing? Were you were because there were cats that would get not you, but I mean women would be like, make them stop, make them. Were, were you? Oh, I would oh, get. I came close. I, I was on the side next uh, opposite Alvin. Yeah. Big, uh, alleyway about this big, and then the drums. I was right there, and I said, "What the hell are they playing?" Because it was so different than I'd ever heard before. But it was really something to behold. And then, believe me, I went and watched them two or three times. And uh, the Alvin Jones was an animal, uh, but he could play straight ahead jazz. I, I got a record with him with, with Bob. Bob. Bookmire. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what am I going to guess? He just plays. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's Bill Evans. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's Bill and, and, and Stan with Elvin and Ron Carter. Yeah. Very straight ahead. But, you know, uh, he, 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 Elvin's feel was like. That feel. But uh, he could play. Play like that, you know, but occasionally. 
Over time, did you did you realize that 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 was really the soundtrack of the civil rights movement for the train was playing? I've talked to enough guys, you know, uh, that you know where, where it was really like a situation where I just think train in a lot of ways the blues was already discovered, uh, jazz, bebop was, discovered. but this this he he didn't want people to be comfortable. He didn't want people to be comfortable. If you were uncomfortable and you wanted to leave, that was fine. But he ra he was agitated. He played with Red Garland's only story. Well, I lived in Dallas for a little while. I played with Red Garland on the weekends, you know. And he told me stories. And he went up the train, pulling over to the bar, said, so he, he said, hey, why, why are you playing this shit? You play it, you know. And the train says, oh, I don't know. I just, you know, <laughs> it's what I feel. So he said, and I even got people into it now, so I couldn't go back to where I used to be. That was his feeling. I played with Red Garland. I played Billy Boy with him. But do you, are you from the Duke Ellington school? I mean, do you believe it's, I mean, because you were, I mean, to me it's like, are, is, is there, is jet so much of that Pacific Jazz catalog that I'm obsessed with that you are on, So you know, the Pass albums, the Claire Fisher albums, I mean, there's bossa rhythms intermixed with acoustic jazz, but then Sun Ra, Train's modal period, Ornette, do you, I mean, that's, it's all valid, isn't it? Well, I, I never really get into I'm just asking you honestly. I just, yeah. I, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ornette and so uh, I mean, they, they don't play this kind of stuff I want, want to listen to. They don't play like uh, harmonic jazz to me. They, they play outside of the changes, you know. They play free, that's, that's right. The they play, they will play, man. I, I have nothing against it. But for me to listen to, I like to hear some, some good changes. And, uh, that's what I like to play with Victor. Man. Yeah, he was so hip harmonically. You know. uh, him and Marty did to play with. I played with him for like 16 years. In fact, not too long ago, was, I saw a bass player, a friend of mine, Lars Guy, who went to his memorial, Bob Bain. Legendary oh, sure, yeah. Uh, Bain. Dear uh, friend of mine. Uh, he's uh, in the same league as Pass and, and Paisano and those oh, cats. Well, you, uh, Bob Bain was a studio player. You know, he, he was like a Tedesco cat. Yeah, kind of, yeah. But he was a rhythm guitar. He was a rhythm guitar for everybody. Billy May, you name know, he was a good rhythm guitar. Everything from Hank Mancini, rhythm guitar, Bob May. Anyway, <laughs> I, saw this, I saw this guy in a bass player, like Paul Gormley, Paul Gormley. I hadn't seen him in years. I did some gigs with him like in the early 70s. And, like, and he said, he got this, in 1974, it was a place called The Times in uh, Studio City. It was a jazz club, restaurant, but uh, I played there quite a bit with Victor. And uh, he had brought a little tape machine and recorded a couple of sets of ours. And it's not bad for that kind of recording, but the, the playing, Victor was like so hot. I mean, how could you not go, yeah, you playing with him, you know? It was just beautiful stuff. How many times, though, truthfully, would you, on the road, you toured a lot, you went on the road with Victor a lot? No, never. You only stayed local and played? Yeah. Played in San Diego. Were you a road dog at any point, though? Uh, I mean, I played with George Shearing. We we go out for six weeks sometimes. That was too long for me. Was it? Were there times where Shearing would walk? I remember talking to the late great Joe Sample, and he'd walk into clubs and he'd say, "Well, what kind of dog du jour do I have to play tonight?" Yeah. Sometimes the keys would be missing, you know. And uh, I mean, did Shearing have to put up with that, or was he no, real? No, he was big enough. He had a Baldwin. He had a Baldwin piano. He had to get a piano for him. But. Uh, yeah, George was a, a great piano player. He didn't swing, though, you know. <laughs> in fact, one night, I was telling someone this recently, we were playing on a club in Seattle. Now, you can always get Joe Pass a solo, so we're playing Stella by Star or something. And all of a sudden, it started really feel good, because it never did, you know. But though George had quit comping, was his comic? Jip, 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 made it stiff. <laughs> Wait, hold on. This, th this was Shearing Pass and you? And Bob Whitlock, the bass player. Holy, I mean, Pass was... Hey, on the vice player. And so, so instead of comping, he just was playing these little... little. He didn't play at all. He just laid out. So that's when it started to feel good. I, I have to say that, because George is an incredible musician. He is, man. And, and he's the, I love... And he was such a hip cat. I mean, he, oh, you know, and he, he brought, he he brought women into, into jazz. The funniest he, people I ever knew. He was, uh, <laughs> he was pretty crazy, really. 
But uh, what happened? I mean, ultimately with Vince, Vince. Vince loved, I mean, he wanted, he, he had, when Mike Clark was playing with him at a certain point, he said, bring a bigger drum kit. Yeah. Because he started to, was playing with cats like Jerry Garcia. I mean, just briefly. The, kind of rock I know yeah. that you must have been on the fringes of that. I mean, no, to, never played any with jazz with Vince. Never. Straight ahead. Right. Not, maybe not with Vince, but I'm just saying you were. Oh, studios. I played a lot of rock for a year in the studio. Can you talk about a couple of of really bizarre experiences playing music that you wouldn't necessarily have thought you would have played on, but you did. Yeah, oh well, yeah. Uh, I remember uh, one time we, they had done a, a recording in New York and the drummer wasn't cutting it. Yeah. So I went in like to rescue it, you know. What an experience. The first night they had an electric pipe. We got so still we couldn't play. <laughs> So we'll come in the next they, night. But, they had an electric electric pipes back. I mean, they have vapes oh, today. Yeah, but I, yeah, I have one. You know, at home. But, I love it. Wait, you had a you had a, you got so lit up you couldn't even play. Couldn't play. It was like the kids come in the morning. So the first thing was like trying to rescue this poor guy. He would, he would like slow down a little bit or fill whatever. But uh, I had to write a drum part for when he would slow down a bit and that kind of stuff. But the, the producer came in. He had a Fedora hat with a plume in it, you know, and you had these two Weimar on it, with a pin on the curtains in the, in the booth. <laughs> I thought, what am I doing here with these people? You right, know? these, this so is, the, you were like, well, these are the riffraff, you know. It's so different to me, you know. But uh, hey, it paid the money, what the hell. I mean, can you talk about your concept of of the one, the downbeat, and the idea? I mean, I kind of already know where you're going to go with this, but, you know, you get into a jam. Uh, it could be with Huard and, 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 and Pass, or it could be with Vince, and you lose, collectively, the group loses the one. And then you all oh, come back and, I can you talk, can you talk about the, your concept of any note being, any note can be the one? Not really. <laughs> why? Explain why. A lot of people would say, in other types of music, it can be. Yeah, but you know, when you, one, two, three, four, you just point ding, 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 you know, that kind of time for you. I never ever thought about that really. I always played what I play, and uh, <laughs> people liked it, so they kept calling me, you know. Uh, well, until, you know. So I go, oh. A dear friend, Denny Sywell's tuning in. We got, you know, and, and uh, he played a lot with Victor Feldman. He did? He did. Uh, <laughs> In, in the not jazz gigs. definitely jazz gigs, straight trio gigs and things, but I'm just saying, Who was, that? was Victor was Victor, um, d did he succumb to the same kind of habits as Chet and Stan, or was he? Did he? Oh, he, no, he, didn't do anything. Victor, he, he was straight. He was straight he ahead. Didn't smoke weed. He did when he was a young guy in London. He did, but he and he didn't feel good behind it. You know, in fact, Victor and his wife Marilyn and John, I my late wife. We'd hang out with their house and our house, and Marilyn and I would get still. My wife like, well, didn't do it, but Victor didn't do it. So there's us like, I, got a, I have a picture on the wall over there, yeah. that's in Vegas. It's just filled with incredible pic. Look at that picture of Vince. That's 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 you and that's you and Vince and and. Uh, oh, here, this, this picture. Yeah. Here. This is in Vegas. Victor, Marilyn. <laughs> Her and I are stoned, and my wife, late wife and, and Victor and I. Oh, are that is classic. Straight. <laughs> did you? Um, I mean, did you? Were you hip to cats like um, Johnny McLaughlin or Rick Laird and those guys? I, I mean, knew, the, I knew Rick in Australia. Sixty before I left. You knew Rick in Australia. He was from New Zealand, and he was playing upright at that time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know him, but he when he played electric bass, if he did. But he was on a lot of stuff in, in the mid '60s at Ryan Scott. He did some stuff with Victor it's on on YouTube or you know Facebook. Uh, really good. But, but he gave up playing. Now he's a photographer or something. You know? Yeah, no, I've been trying to reach him for an interview. He won't. He really never gets back to me. I guess now that now I know why. I mean, did, do you do you recall your first time in the studios? Was it in England? Yeah. And and, and talk about what what session was. It was at uh, Abbey Road Studio. I knew it. I knew it. 1952. 52 at Abbey Road. First, first record session. 
And I have a picture of that too. But what were you playing, like Blueberry Hill? Or what were you playing? No, no, it was like Rick Dick, 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 and then Cross Hands Boy, Boogie Woody stuff. Dig. So I'm for that one. Dig, dig, dig. And dig. Dig. Al Cooper Chiro. <laughs> stuff you know but she became a big star uh, they never played me anymore and I was getting in the beginning but anyway but it was the chance to play and, and get, get out and have people see me or hear me play but yeah I did a lot of studio work with her we used to do these radio lesson work shows you know, it was every week and uh, did quite a lot of recording with her actually uh, most of which I was the last of it Emails me as a bit way for that one. It's crazy. But, uh, Do you remember the? Is it fair to? Can you talk a little bit about the evolution? Like I talked to you about the Stan Getz project, um, but what was the the first Bossa record that you were on that had Bossa rhythms? Was the Garaldi uh, was jazz impressions of Black Orb? Yeah, and was, was there anything that preceded that, like the Claire Fisher albums? That you were on World Pacific. Those well, that, that was after. That was after this. That was one of the first when I went to, uh, to LA. Right. So I just what I'm trying to get at is the concept of like did Vince t explain to you he wanted to fuse those rhythms or how did that how did that come? We just, we just played them as Jeff <laughs> Black Orpheus, you know, like that. Yeah. Some of the Orpheus. I had no idea what I was. Just play like a, you know. You had no idea. Uh, I, I, I just love that. I. But then Vince, the, the first Los Alberto record we heard, 1961, right. he called me and he said, you've got to come over here. It changed our lives musically, you know, that, that music. It's so harmonic. That's why I love harmonic music. Man. But doesn't that change? Because I don't want to know. You know. I'm, I'm terrible like that, really. Well, I mean, you, you know, you, I mean, you've, that your bread and butter is that. I mean, did you... Were you playing bebop? I mean, in the fifty, in the late fifties, did you did, were you playing bebop gigs? I mean, the Australian Jazz Quartet to me was I don't Pretty think commercial jazz. But when I was playing with, with Bryce's group, we played we did a couple of albums, but uh, we played jazz, but it was like what I call like polite jazz. Yeah. <laughs> Just after I came to the states, uh, I was playing with Vince, you know, and. I've only been in the States maybe six months, eight months, and I'm playing with Gene Ammons, you know. And Judd, mate, he played so hard and left. He didn't need a microphone. And I'm playing my little Australian jazz stuff behind him. He turned around to me and says, Whale! Whale. You know, it's similar to a friend, a dear friend of mine, Tony Leone, was uh, playing behind Jackie McLean, and he was kind of doing the same thing. I mean, not polite, but just playing what he thought was technically. Right, and Jackie turned around and goes, give me all you got. Well, it was a feel. That it, yeah, that's more right. More swinging, harder swinging. But I, you know, I learned from that, believe me. But I played playing with Ben Webster. And then I, there's a thing on, on Facebook that people post. Yeah. I and mean, he's sitting behind Ben when he's playing Chelsea mm -hmm. Bread. You know? I mean, he's talking about a thrill. Like, you know, just, uh, every time he played it, it was just pretty much every night. But uh, we did... Three weeks of the jazz workshop, six nights a week, and Sunday afternoons. I never did that, you know, but you just got used to it. And then we did this uh, Ralph J. Gleason, uh, uh, what was the TV show called? Oh, yeah, no, I, and, and he, it was on public television. Uh, yeah. Tremendous educator, dude. I, I, I sort of pride myself after that. Uh, I mean, is it fair? Jazz Casual, it was called. Jazz Casual. Anyone who came in to San Francisco did that show. TV show. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, I saw Ross on Roland Kirk on that. Yeah, well, I played that uh, with uh, Ben Webster, Jimmy Weatherspoon, and Vince and Marty. And uh, there's some good clips of that on the yeah. Can you tell the audience about the album that really got me into music was Joy Spring? And that's yeah. you, Jim Hewart, Joe Pass, and Mike yeah. Wofford. Yeah. And that was done at a movie house. Yeah. I, I want you to take us through that story. Uh, but we, we had done, I was telling you, we'd done our gigs, we went there 
was like two o'clock in the morning right. it started. That's when Cam was before us. And uh, we're like falling asleep in the dressing room, like on the door. You guys are up next. And we go out there. That's the first tune we play was like, hey. <laughs> It took, it took a while to get... Well, there. no, but I'm just saying, who, what, did you know in advance that it was being recorded? No. No. Wow. No, I, I mean... Think, I think Joe got recorded quite a bit, yeah, but we did an album once with Hank Williams, too. Joe hated it. And he said, there's no changes to play out so Hank Williams got recorded. Yeah. Hank Williams got recorded. Hank Williams got recorded. He said, there's no changes to play out so after Joe died, someone in Japan released it. <laughs> you wouldn't like that. Uh, That's what happened. It never got pressed. It, I, I'm just trying to figure out, was, was somebody... You wouldn't know this, obviously. You were just trying to stay awake. But, really? yeah. yeah, I mean, but, but, uh, you, when did you actually find out that there was a recording? 15 years later? Oh, much, much later. Yeah, Christ, many, many years. I have no idea. There's a few things I was on I didn't know was uh, being recorded. You know? the, Chris Parker's tuning in, legendary drummer, and he was just raving about your book, Bass Drum Control. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. Amazing feat, he says about you. And, uh, what I guess I just want to go back to this idea of what you were hearing that you that you changed as it related to bass drum control, well, like because we were talking about Kluke earlier, and then obviously there's other cats, but what was you don't have to demonstrate it obviously because you, you haven't been shedding, but I mean well, I you know, but I mean what 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 was your niche on that? Why is it sold well, so? I, I came up with this technique where I could play beats, to, you know, like three or four beats, and maybe more, or whatever. But it was nice to, I used to bass drum all the time in, in solo, you know. Uh, everything I play is you know, the bass drum. I love it. Uh, that's what I told you, I love Alan Dawson, he could use a bass drum. Not many guys did, even the great drummers didn't use a bass drum. What about Mac? Max Roach? Uh, yeah, but like Boat Bomb, you know, he didn't use it like, like I do, or Alan Dawson. Well, well, explain the delineation between, you, like Roach was, how were you using it compared to Roach? Well, I've I got a lot more beats. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, so more polyrhythmic stuff. Well, I just did, like, yeah, it's, 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 it's just in solo, maybe. I didn't use it back when I was playing time, but uh, it was just something I came up with, you know, I, by, kind of by accident, naturally. And, uh, That's always the best way to do it. I mean, it was kind of like the, it was kind of like the rhythm that you put together with Vince. Uh, for You know, you didn't know what you were doing with Samba. I, you just, I, really, really. I just feel like that, I mean... Also, is there something to be said for the idea that a lot of times in the studio you didn't have, a, you maybe had a, only a couple of hours. You really had to, you, you, there was no time to think. You just well, had to hit. Studio stuff, like when I was doing the Tonight Show, I used to stuff with Sean the Tonight Show. Shaughnessy, did, that is, that is in, in, in L.A. when he was out? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that, that's different. I mean, that, that, yeah. I was, I was there a lot because he was always doing drum plays. We'd pay a lot more money. I love that but, cat, but dude. But, you know, he had to be able to, they would bring the music in, run through it, camera, show. You never got like, can I try that again? You'd have to go, boom, first off. Right away, you'd have to be able to read it and play it. In fact, when, when some of that ps, 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 drumming stuff, you would come in with drum parts and all that stuff on it. It was, it was kind of tough to read, but you just had to do it. But uh, reading was a big part of my career, you know, like, the, the bands I got into. Do you know Simon Phillips? Yeah, sure. Simon, great drummer. Well, his dad had a Dixieland band, he was sick for that. And I played in that band in 1958 before I went to Australia. It was a Dixieland band Dixieland in, in, in Dixieland in, in, in England. Oh, yeah, Dixieland was pretty popular in England. Wow. There was a few Dixieland bands, but that was, it wasn't the best, but it was kind of a little corny and stuff. But it, had, it was new music, you had to read everything, you know? So, uh, what was I telling you about that? Well, tell, tell, tell the audience a, a, a good. Uh, Stan Getz story. Stan Getz story. Well, I can't do the junkie. No, it's, it, I think it's also very important to note that uh, people could score I, not just cocaine. People, doctors would pr prescribe heroin in, in England. Oh yeah, I, I, I told you it, I, in Piccadilly Circus, like midnight. So they get after midnight. Piccadilly Circus. Piccadilly Circus. Piccadilly Circus. Cir what was there's a club? No, Piccadilly Circus is the area of London. Okay. West End. Dig yeah. They got the, uh, the, the statue of Eros in the middle of it. Uh, oh, God, I got so many stories. Man. I did a stories night at the local drum shop in Glensboro. 35 people showed up to my stories. But, uh, so wait, so, but I just want to be clear. I mean, you could get a prescription yes, for, yeah. for heroin as yeah, well. Yeah, you could. 
I don't know about cocaine. I, I never knew anything about cocaine. Alan Schwartzberg said that you could get that, uh, get a doctor's prescription if you were having like uh, diarrhea or oh, yeah, you know diarrhea. things like that. But oh, with, I'll try to remember that next time I have diarrhea. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but talk about gets though. I, I just want to know about because there's this nexus between genius and addiction. Well, you know, when I play, the couple of things I play with, it was just really nice with them, you know. You know, it's a short rehearsal, a couple of things. But uh, <laughs> the one, it, they were on the Jazz and the Fellow Tour in England, that's what, 1958. I actually saw them play at a concert. So Lou Levy told me this story. Uh, they had run out, you know, they couldn't wait to get to the hotel. They need their fix. Oh, you know, yeah, so Lou said he rushed and rushed and they, Go to his room, go on the phone, you know, say, can I have the hotel doctor, please? And she says, sorry, sir, the doctor is in Mr. Getz's room. He said he doesn't know how Stan beat him to it, but he did, you know. He set that up in advance. Uh, Stan was like, meet me there at Maybe this time, you know. And then, and then Baker driving like a maniac on the highway. I mean, are you surprised yeah, you're still even here? A fast driver. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I played, a check came back to L.A. in, what, 65? Yeah. And in all his gigs until I went back with George Shearing in summer of 1966. The last game I did in L.A. was with, uh, with Chet at that time, at the Chubbies, with Mike Walker and Marty. Remember all this stuff. But he was beautiful to work for me. So he had the best time. You know, it was just like, so easy to play with. And yeah. his phrasing was amazing. Oh, God. I, mean, I just loved the way he played, you know. I loved his singing. You had a chance to play with Dizzy in, in uh, and I and who else? It was there's a picture of him up there, right there, right there. Picture of the, it was with the Australian group that I came over here with, right there. That's in '58. Sixty-one. Sixty-one. I mean, but and then there was a who who was the female singer you got a chance to play with there too? Sarah Vaughan. Sarah Vaughan. There's a picture of her too. Sarah Vaughan, I mean, what did you rec? There's Sarah right there. Did you recognize the? Um, I mean, at that time, how were they? How were those people received? They were. Dizzy was never a millionaire. Uh, he probably should have been, but he was respected in this country, United you know, States, because of his genius. Yeah. What was the viewpoint of them? The yeah. Oh, he was, he was received. I mean, Christ, how can you not love Dizzy and Sarah? I played for Sarah there with Roland Hannon, the piano player, and uh, the bass player was from the Australian group. And uh, at the end of the end of Was the it season, Jim Gannon? No, Ed Gaston is me. Gaston. Uh, another dear friend of mine. He's gone too. All my friends are gone. No, they're, no, they're not. They're, they're all they're tuning in right now. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, and they're up there. They're they're all watching yeah, right now. I just want to know. About, w w there was no color bar. Australia is there's no. racism everywhere in this world. You was, know. At that time, when I first came to the states, there was no racism. Huh? I mean, Bob Whitlock and I. People wanted people. Went to a jazz club in Detroit on a night off to hear. Something I mean, but. Yeah. We never felt any, you know. There was no vibe. No, no. There was no bad. It was no. no. Uh, it was just. In fact, you know, some of my friends, black guys, would use the N word as a joke, you know. And but still, know, well, this still happens now. Oh yeah, but musicians were telling it like in a funny way, you know, like a comment. <laughs> I bought a Cadillac in a mad moment when I was making a lot of money, and. Uh, my wife didn't kill me when I got home. So, I was at the drum shop one time and, and uh, Earl Palmer was there. Oh. Uh, dear friend. Uh, and, uh, oh, man, are you kidding me? Oh, I, In LA? Yeah, he gave me a lot of work, Earl. Man. He told guys, I can't make this TV show. You're going to call Colin Bay. He did the same thing with Hal Blaine, oh, too. A lot of work. Well, Hal Blaine was 42, was he? But, uh, oh, man, was a same cheese. Oh, you're cool. Earl Palmer. Earl Palmer. Oh, yeah. I bought this cat, like one time we went out in the parking lot together at the drum shop. I'm getting in this cat, he says, Hey man, what are you doing, John, with a cat? Like he said, Only oh, oh, and, and G was driving Cadillacs. <laughs> I thought that was priceless, right? 
Do you think one of the issues we have today going on is that we take ourselves too seriously? I remember Dick Burke talking about Dick Burke. Dick, uh, Dick, Cal, Cal Jader's band at one time had Cal Jader, who was an alcoholic, John Hurd, who had a stuttering problem. Um, Dick Burke was 400 pounds. He was very yeah, overweight. Yeah. So everybody was poking fun at each other, yeah. <clears throat> whether it was their ethnicity. And, and we are so in this hotbed of political correctness and I don't want to say that's either right or wrong, but did you guys take yourselves less seriously? Oh, yeah. I never thought about anything like that. Honestly, no. We just, we talked the way we talked. And you weren't worried about offending people is what I'm saying. I mean, that's the I, point. I don't think I ever offended anybody. I was careful about that. But even the swearing. I mean, I swear a lot. But, you know, if I'm with the ladies or something, I, I, I don't, you know, I cut it out. But uh, it wasn't until not that long ago it started to get weird, you know. You have to be careful what you said. Or, you know. But uh, I'm pretty open. You know. uh, do, you, do you know about Fernwood tonight, by the way? You have a treat on your hands, my friend. That, that was a TV show, yeah, I think. Yeah, I, think so. and, uh, I, was, I was a mirth maker. Happy kind of mirth maker. You were acting. What? Acting? Yeah, you might say that. They booked, they, they booked a band. They booked me because I'm a nut. I, said, I was proud of that. Tommy Tedesco, because he looked like a thug, he wore a black suit and a black shirt and a yellow tie. They wanted an accordion player, they got a very good one, but they just wanted an accordion, this is accordion. And the bass player, they hired because he looked like a soft shoe. So that was the band, and they wanted it to sound bad, and it did. You know, <laughs> a couple of times it was like a train wreck, and this singer, uh, he used to bow after me, his rug would come off, you know. But uh, it was a total train wreck, birth of the blues, I'll never forget it. So we go, are we going to do that again? And they call from the booth, that was great, guys! It's like, it was as bad as it could possibly get, and it was almost great. You know? I had a lot of fun with that. We did two seasons, uh, three months each, and uh, that was... So, but there's a lot of stuff on, on YouTube of that. Uh, oh, what's the one? Boogie Fever, you got to look up Boogie Fever. Well, I mean, when you were at North Texas, though, well, how did you, how, how did you feel you best educated your students at that time? There was North Texas was one of the few schools that had yeah. a jazz curriculum, but how would you get them uh, get them ready to play on the bandstand? Well, I, I tried to teach them what I do and my technique and my concept of this stuff. You know, some of them took it and some didn't, but. Uh, I just didn't like the way they were. Uh, they had all these drum books, which were total bullshit to me. I mean, is this well, why? Why? Why were they? Why? I mean, you you wrote your own drum books. So why? Why were yeah, they? Yeah, but they were playable. Some of this stuff. Too dense. Where, where would you use it? You know, it's, it's a book by two guys that I know, uh, Mark Dobrin and Elliot Fine. They were players with the Minneapolis Symphony. Fantastic percussionists and beautiful people. They wrote this book like four way something. Like when would you use it, man? These guys would go and practice their ass off, like, right? <laughs> trying to get this together. And I, I said, I don't want to get into that. Let me show you this, you know? Show you how to play. <laughs> so that was more Texas. I mean, like, but I had some good times there playing, you know? There was a few good players there. Uh, but playing with Red. Red was a piece of work, man. Red Mitchell was teaching at the... Yeah, Red Garland. Garland? Yeah, he, he moved back there. He was Whoa, Red you Red. played with Red Garland? Oh, I played there weekends with him for a long time. Holy cow. If he, if he was sober, he was great. But when he was juiced, man, forget it. Oh. <laughs> his his bells were so slow. I used to look at the brush just... Listening. The bass player used to sweat the downbeats. That's how it was. You know. But he was... Red was beautiful. Man. I got so many great stories about him. He was a piece of work, Red. Right? Oh, tell one. I mean, tell, tell, us, tell a story. He was... I went to hear it with Vince in San Francisco. When I, one time we were getting off kind of reasonably early. We'd go to hear the last set of the jazz workshop or Black Hawk. So we went to hear Red, and he played till 3.30 in the morning because he didn't show up to him. The gig in, in North Texas State, uh, in uh, Dallas, started at 9.30. Sure. He, he would show up a quarter of 11. And the owner comes in, he goes straight to the bar and says, hey, give me a call one, baby. And say, oh, I don't know. Totally not aware of what, no, no tick, there was no TikTok time going no, on, yeah. The owner, the owner of the club would come to me and say, get him on the bandstand. I said, you get him on the bandstand. You'll get up there when he feels like it. That's the way it was. Oh man, there's so many great memories. The, the poor bass player, been sweating the downbeats on the ballad, you know. 
Do <laughs> classic stuff. Not, not no metronome. I mean, everybody had their own inter. Who who did you play with that had the the most? You know where the beat fell in the weirdest place, but they had impeccable time. Oh jeez, I don't know. Victor Victor had his oh, own. Victor had to see. Victor was a swinger man. It's too. I played with you know, a great piano player, Jimmy Rawls. Jimmy Rawls it was his own guy, man. He's, I have lots of stories about him too. I have a picture of, I did an album with him and Red Mitchell, man. There's a picture of it up here. A big picture. And his daughter Stacy was played the flu or something. It was Red, too. Yeah. Red, Red, he said something about me once. And I just, I was honored. I mean, Red to me was one of the all time incredible musicians. Going from five string to four string cello tuning, like, you know, like, just do it, you know, gee. But, uh, I could. Uh, well, what did he say about you? He said one time he liked my playing so much because I never stepped on anyone's nuance. What a thing to say. I went, oh, oh I've never had anything nicer than that in my life, said about me. Step on anyone's nuance. He was a class guy, really. Class. Did you, 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 you mentioned to me off air that you've been, you felt fortunate that you've always been able to play this music. Yeah. All right, but I mean... I've always played the, the drums. I've never done anything but play the drums my whole life. Did you see, did you have peers that, 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 that didn't make it? That, that... Peers. Oh, gee, I don't know. I'm saying like longevity in music, the, the, it, has it been a healing force for you? Oh, yeah, it has. Well, and could you give an example of, of, a, of a time when it uh, healed you, and not necessarily physically, but in a spiritual way? Uh, well, just recently. <laughs> I've gone through this illness stuff, man. But you have in music, it just... When I listen to music, I just forget everything else. You know, even if it's bad time. <laughs> but... Uh, I mean, it's a lot of stuff I did in the studios. You know, I just went in and did it, you know. Especially when we had carnage. I just take my cymbals in, put the cymbals on, do the gig, walk out. They would do the, I had three drum sets. And I was pretty busy at one time. Mostly TV shows I did. You, you Damu Romano gets the credit for this Joe Beam oh, yeah. well, he was Sinatra album, but you were on, you oh, played, well, Frank, yeah. Frank came up and shook your hand? And, uh, yeah, he did. When I walked in the studio, he came over and shook my hand. I was, that was a thrill, believe me. Man. I mean, I'm from Strat St. Margaret, which is a village outside of a small town in the west of England. And I, I was into Sinatra, like in the, when he started making records, we were in the late 40s, mid 40s. And, you know, to, to play with him and, and to have him come over and shake my head, I was like, it was a thrill, really. I, mean, I just, God, you know. Yeah. But that, that was a memorable, memorable night. But I would have been on the whole thing had I not been working with George here. Who was the best uh, leader that you worked with for a prolonged period of time, and and why, and what what made them a great leader? Victor, Victor had such great music. Yeah, Victor had charts on everything. He had a book, you know, like. <laughs> so pre being prepared made him. But what else made? As far as on the bandstand, the, the nonverbal leadership skills. What what did he have? Just his time, you know. He just he, he always carried things off. Once in a while he started by himself, it was a blue or something, but it was always so together with him. We rehearsed quite a bit, you know. And in fact, he wrote these hard bass parts, like Latin things. And it took Monty, Monty was a great player, but he was just, uh, not say slow on the reading, but this was like difficult stuff. Absolutely, he was not used, that was not in his bag. We were getting patient, you know. <laughs> Monty, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Victor, he wrote some great stuff. I got, these memories, he coming back to me. We played in Vegas, 1964. Uh, first time I ever played there. We played at Sam. Was Jerry Lewis? Sure. Was a star. He wanted a jazz group. He could come in here with his breaks and after. I love it. So Victor Monty and me, you know. So we started like around midnight, whatever the clock is over there. And uh, before us was Maury King with the violins, as Jewish as you can get. Man, last thing was this tall lady in the, in the black dress. In a town where ha 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 ha. So we get up there after that. There's all these people <laughs> in there that like that stuff. We start playing that. We go, uh, Victor played this out of this world. It's like da da. <laughs> it's 
tell us if it didn't do anything like a hard bass part. So we start playing. And Victor gave the microphone, he's, he's a London voice. And they got a nice little chat. My name is Victor Feldman. Well, along with Colin Bay or Jones, but he bothered on the bass. We like to play for you our, our rendition of Out of This World. And we started to see the people who went, ah, and they were run, running out the doors, right? Like literally, you know, they were leaving in a hurry. The, but because it was breakneck tempo, or they couldn't, they couldn't, no, they couldn't recognize they, it. They didn't know what the hell the music was, and they were so big, like beyond it. After half an idea, you have to go into. Well, the klezmer. I mean, well, I mean the the, the indigenous uh, Jewish music. I mean that that in itself would be a huge well, change. It was. Yeah, 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 we're playing like some hip jazz thing, you know. They like run. I'll never forget that. <laughs> Victor said to me, I'll feel a draft. <laughs> I'll feel a draft. <laughs> you know, before I let you go, Colin, and this people have been loving this interview, but oh, um, thank you. I wanted I wanted you to talk about um, Ray Brown and Ray and, Brown. and and just the, the kind of cat that he was. And uh, uh, Ray was strong, man. He was the strongest bass player. You had to follow him. If he wanted to like, take, take it up a bit, man, you had to go. He had to step all over him. And uh, but. He, He's sad in this time. I was honored to play with him. I, Oscar Pearson played in Australia when I was living there, and uh, I told him, I said, I'd just like to play one chorus with you. you know? And I got to play with him, you know, uh, quite a bit. And, uh, but this one time, man, like Ray Brown, Ray Brown, you know. Uh, he sung for Monty with Victor. Victor had this big, thick book with some of the hard bass parts. So we did this. Uh, most beautiful girl in the world is on the uh, what they all call what is a wonderful world. Hard. So Ray says, he's looking through the books, he says, hey Gates, uh, what's this most beautiful girl in the world? Rich is like, well Ray, you know, I said, oh, that's something you should, should kind of go through first. Ray said, hey, it's Ray Brown, man. So we played it so Ray. <laughs> Screwed it Sm up, man. He just screwed it up. He did? Yeah. He's like, it's, it needed it going over, you know, to, to look at what, what was happening. It was difficult to read. Then you know, 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 but Victor, I turned around, we went to laugh. Ray Brown, man, got stepping on his, you know. We're all human, you know. But, you know, to play with him, man. When he called me to play with his quintet, I was so honored, I can't tell you. Playing with Ray, man, I just loved playing with him. When you, uh, just what, what is your gut feeling? What does your gut tell you about the future of, mu uh, of, of music? I'll, no. be, I'll be gone by then. No, but I mean, yeah. it, 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 but, I you know, from the time, I mean, you've been on this earth a lot longer than, 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 Most. than me. Uh, and, you know, I am searching for that link in the chain, the lineage to keep the lineage together, um, and I just even uh, what what is it about the pulse and the and the tension release of jazz that you believe will it will allow it to sustain? Well, you know, the jazz has changed so much with harmonic music. You know, uh, outside changes like tr trading plates. Oh. Yeah, and. Uh, it doesn't appeal to me anymore, unless I hear some harmonic. That's why I love Brazilian music so much. It's harmonic music. Being in the seven fast is harmonic. But uh, I, I don't know where it's going to go. I have no idea. Really. If somebody was searching for originality in their playing, um, what would you tell them? Well, you know, what I tell, you, tell students, they just listen to, listen to the guys, Philly Joe and... Well, a great drummer. If you listen to them, you, you get something from it. I mean, I, I, I have no advice really for people coming up other than to do that. That's why I tell the students, I haven't done any teaching in a little while. The thing is that people, the drummers, that don't want what I do. My bass drum technique, why would they want to get Well, I don't know if that's true. I mean, it's still selling oh, quite a bit of... It's, it's, it's most... It's, it's, it's most popular with cats that are using pulsating double bass drums now. Well, it, that's what I use my bass drum for. And, it, <laughs> and, it's, and, and it's so it's, it's in more of a, a hip hop or rock kind of rock setting, would you say? Uh, 
play, play, play like in solo, you know, dig it, dig it, dig it, and play over it, you know. But uh, I don't want my bass drum technique. It takes too much practice. Okay, I, I just, this is important. Back, just for, for people that are going to watch this in 20 years. Yeah. What, what do you want people to take from your book? Obviously, people have run with it and, and made it their own. They're doing their thing. But what do you want, most importantly for people, what, is it, what do they have to practice? Well, bass drum control? It depends on what you want to play. I mean, if anybody playing jazz these days, uh, I don't know, they can play probably four in the bar in, in tunes, but play, uh, this technique that I got into by accident is uh, it's just... You can use it in solo way. Most guys don't do that. So, you know, for people in the future, I mean, I, I have no idea what to tell them. They, they can use it in solo way. Yeah, that's, that's how I used it. I, there's no reason to, to... I mean, some of these the rock guys or the fusion guys, they can play all the stuff. They can get able to play in other things, you know. Uh, but the way I use a bass drum, it's just so different. You know? And it would be like with Vince... Uh, you leave the head of the tune, he'd solo, but then it would break up, and then you you could just play a solo in that. Well, with... I, I, he gave me eight fours or eights. I yeah. don't like playing fours because they're too short. But uh, I like to play, I told you I like to play choruses. And because, um, you know, if you know the tune, you have to know the tune, or if you don't, you know. But. Uh, it's hard to know what to say to people in the future. I have no idea where it's going to go. But I know what I'm getting at is what was your original intention for the idea? Of uh, my bass drum technique? Yes. To use it in solo. To use it in solo. That's it. No, that's it. Because that, that's all. That, then people can work. Yeah. All I'm saying is I want that indigenous thought to put into people's minds. Because, yeah. you know, I think it's cool that people can take it and, and mold it into other things. You may not dig it or not. But it's about you can use your bass drum control in soloing. And it, you can do it in ballads and, and in, in up-tempo stuff. Well, when you solo, I mean, I... I... He gave me a solo once at the, at the uh, village Vanguard. They're playing around midnight, and I'm joking. They give me a chorus. Piano player goes, "You got it." And I'm playing a chorus on around midnight, a ballad. <laughs> I was like, "Oh yeah." But that was an experience. I look out, and there's Art Blakey sitting out there. I go, oh, "Christ!" And, but, um, and Max Roach came in once when I was playing. But uh, oh, nice guys. Man. But yeah, I mean, I. Just, my bass drum technique, man, it's like it's gone because anybody that wants to work on it, it takes so long to get it together. And it took me so long to, to keep it up. But I, I told you I've gone through these health issues. I haven't been able to practice for a while. You can't lose it. Especially on the limbs, you know. Like, when you get older, man, it doesn't work like they used to. But I still love to play. And I'll come in here and play in my drum room. Oh, do you st you're still playing your ass off. Do you want to finish with a, with a little bit? No, not really. All right. No, you don't have to. <laughs> Colin Bailey, what an honor. Bailey, what an honor, man. Thank you for making my day, brother. Why, well, hey, thank you for having me. I mean, honestly, it's very nice of me you know, to talk about what I've done. And, uh... True insight from a true master. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. We'll see you later.